Hello, Planeswalkers. This is Eric again from Bain Alley Magic, bringing you yet another Commander Deck Tech video. Today we're going to talk about Kenrith Super Friends. But before we do, a quick reminder, if you like this video and you hit that like button or that subscribe button, that would be most appreciated. So the first thing I want to say about Will and Rowan is I don't like the artwork. In fact, every time I look at it, it's worse. You know, I hate to diss on the artist, Anna Steinbauer, but she did a pretty poor job. The male figure looks, you know, really girlish, almost more like a mannequin. And the next issue I have is that the imagery just isn't dynamic, you know? It's not exciting, it's not art that makes you want to play the cards. It's just mediocre. So, to do justice to my new commanders, I decided to make my own versions of them. So, Will Kenrith is a legendary planeswalker for four and two blue. Enters with four loyalty counters, says for plus two until your next turn up to two target creatures each have base power and toughness of zero three and lose all abilities for minus two target player draws two cards until your next turn instant sorcery and planeswalker spells that player casts cost two less to cast minus eight target player gets an emblem with whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell copy it you may choose new targets for the copy then we have Rowan Kenrith, four and two red, for a planeswalker that enters with four loyalty counters. It says plus two during target player's next turn, each creature that player controls attacks if able. Minus two, Rowan deals three damage to each tapped creature target player controls. And for minus eight, target player gets an emblem with whenever you activate an ability that isn't a mana ability, you copy it and you may choose new targets for the copy. So the strategy with these two as your commanders may not be entirely clear at first, as you have six different abilities to consider. The thing that stood out to me was the synergy with Planeswalkers. First there's Will's plus two ability, giving Planeswalkers protection from some bigger threats. Then his minus two ability, which will make each of our Planeswalkers two less to cast, and that is awesome. Will's ultimate, however, only helps minimally as we only run about 12 instants and sorceries in the deck. But, you know, it's not bad. Rowan's plus two ability may seem detrimental, but as long as we have blockers, it can actually force our opponents to end up killing their smaller creatures. Also, remember that if we don't want our opponents to attack us, we can also target ourselves. If we have Rowan and Will out at the same time, Will's plus two will lessen the downside of Rowan's plus two. Rowan's minus two ability also works well with her plus two ability, as the combination can result in three damage to all of that target player's creatures. But the ability I'm basing the deck around is Rowan's ultimate ability, because Planeswalker abilities are activated abilities. Rowan's emblem, therefore, will double all of our Planeswalker activations. This is very powerful, and that is, how, that is how we are planning on winning the game, by activating our Planeswalkers over and over again and doubling their ultimate abilities. So, the first plan of the deck is to protect Rowan and get her ultimate emblem as quickly as possible. But before we talk about how we are going to protect her, let's talk about the other Planeswalkers in the deck, of which we have 21. So first is our one creature that turns into a Planeswalker, Chandra, Fire of Kaladesh. For one and two red, you get a 2-2 Human Shaman. And Chandra says, whenever you cast a red spell, you untap Chandra. And then you can tap Chandra to have Chandra, Fire of Kaladesh, deal one damage to target player. If Chandra has dealt three or more damage this turn, exile her and then return her to the battlefield transformed under her owner's control. So, then she transforms into the Planeswalker, Chandra, Roaring Flame. She has four loyalty counters to start. For plus one, Chandra, Roaring Flame deals two damage to target player. Minus two, Chandra, Roaring Flame deals two damage to target creature. Minus seven, Chandra, Roaring Flame deals six damage to each opponent. Each player dealt damage this way gets an emblem with at the beginning of your upkeep, this emblem deals 
three damage to you. So just imagine if we happened to ultimate Rowan Kenrith, getting her emblem, doubling all of our activated abilities, and then we would get two emblems out of Chandra Roaring Flame, right? So each of our opponents would get uh, two emblems, actually. That would make uh, <laughs> six emblems, right, that are each dealing three our opponent three damage. That's pretty awesome. Next we have Dak Faden, one, a blue, and a red for a Planeswalker that enters with three loyalty counters. For plus one, target player draws two cards, then discards two cards. Minus two, gain control of target artifact. And for minus six, you get an emblem with whenever you cast a spell that targets one or more permanents, gain control of those permanents. So this is really great for, you know, card draw at first and just gaining control of things right away. And as anyone who plays Commander knows, there are lots of artifacts going around out there. So that is pretty sweet. Yep, so these are our first two Planeswalkers. Uh, Chandra, Fire of Kaladesh, I think will not have a hard time uh, transforming in this deck. Almost all of our spells are red. I mean, you know, they're not all red, obviously, but there are plenty enough red spells where it would not be hard to get this off. Uh, also, you know, it says if she has dealt three or more damage this turn, uh, not necessarily by tapping. You can attack with her, then deal two combat damage, then cast a red spell and untap her, and deal the one more damage. So, really, transforming Chandra isn't going to be hard. Dak Faden is definitely going to be gaining control of some artifacts early on. Next, we have Sarkin Fireblood. One and two red for a Planeswalker that enters with three loyalty counters. Plus one, you may discard a card if you do draw a card, or you can plus one to add two mana in any combination of colors, spend this mana only to cast dragon spells, or minus seven, create four five five red dragon creature tokens with flying. So we're not going to be using the second plus one ability whatsoever in this deck, but you know, just being able to draw cards is fabulous, but more importantly, uh, this is one way we can close out the game, you know, just by making a bunch of dragons. Maybe if we have Rowan's ultimate uh, emblem out, then we can make eight 5-5 five, five dragons. That is like 40 power on the battlefield flying right there. That's pretty awesome. Next we have Naraset, Parter of the Veils. One, eh, Parter of Veils, excuse me, no the, <laughs> one and two blue she enters with five loyalty counters. She says as her static ability, each opponent can't draw more than one card each turn. And for minus two, you look at the top four cards of your library, you may reveal a non-creature, non-land card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So, with Neurosit's ability, you can reveal Planeswalkers and put them into your hand. That's really important. But also, you know, limiting the amount of cards our opponents can draw is huge. Next we have Tybalt, Rakish Instigator. Two and a red for a Planeswalker that enters with five loyalty. As his static ability, he says your opponents can't gain life. And for minus two, you create a 1-1 one, one red devil creature token with when this creature dies, it deals one damage to any target. So, Tybalt's other Planeswalker card is, uh, you know, pr pretty bad. But this one, I don't think isn't so bad. You know, just, uh, especially in, you know, our theme, you know, we're kind of sort of a burn deck, you know, is, or, you know, just dealing damage, you know, we don't want our opponents gaining a ton of life, and being that the other Tybalt is so bad, you know, and Tybalt is just famous for being bad, this is a Planeswalker that is probably going to survive <laughs> longer than you think, you know, it's, it's one that your opponents might not be so threatened by, until they forget about it and try to gain 40 life, and you're like, nah, -uh. and then they'll be like, okay, well, fine, we have to kill Tybalt. But I think Tybalt will actually survive a lot longer than you think, and just, you know, that effect all by itself is pretty powerful, especially in this sort of themed deck. And, uh, yeah, also he makes tokens. That's great. We want tokens in this deck to protect our Planeswalkers. That's excellent. Moving along, we have Sahili Sublime Artificer. One and two hybrid blue-red mana. She enters with five loyalty counters. She says... As her static ability, whenever you cast a non-creature spell, create a 1-1 colorless servo artifact creature token. And for minus two, target artifact you control becomes a copy of another target artifact or creature you control until the end of the turn, except it's an artifact in addition to its other types. 
So, what's most important about Sahili here is she's giving every single one of our Planeswalkers protection. As soon as we're casting that Planeswalker, we get a 1-1 servo that'll help protect that Planeswalker. And, you know, maybe if we have some uh, big mana rock out, we do have a, a couple of artifacts. I know of at least one artifact that it would be really cool to make our servo token a copy of. So, uh, if we could have a couple of those, that's pretty game-winning. Uh, it's a contagion engine, just a spoiler, but we'll get there. Continuing, we have Chandra Fire Artisan. Two and two red, she enters with four, lo four loyalty counters. Her static ability is whenever one or more loyalty counters are removed from Chandra Fire Artisan, she deals that much damage to target opponent or planeswalker. For plus one, you exile the top card of your library and you may play it this turn. Minus seven, exile the top seven cards of your library, you may play them this turn. So, Chandra, her minus seven ability doesn't sound so fabulous, but when you double it up with Rowan, you know, you are going to be exiling the top 14 cards of your library and, uh, you know, having a lot more choices of what to cast. And, you know, you're going to be dealing seven damage to target opponent or planeswalker. That's pretty sweet. Um, but, yeah, also, just if you only have this out just doing the plus one ability... Uh, that's card advantage right there, certainly. Next we have Kazmina, Enigmatic Mentor. For three and a blue, you get a Planeswalker that enters with five loyalty counters. She says, spells your opponent's cast that target a creature or Planeswalker you control cost two more to cast. And for minus two, you create a 2-2 two -two blue wizard creature token, draw a card, and then discard a card. So Kazmina is pretty sweet in a Planeswalker deck. She's protecting our Planeswalkers, she's making creatures that protect our Planeswalkers, and she's drawing us cards. Excellent. Moving along, we have Jace, Wielder of Mysteries. One and three blue for another Planeswalker from the War of the Spark set. Enters with four loyalty counters. His static ab ability is, if you would draw a card while your library has no cards in it, you win the game instead. Plus one, target player puts the top two cards of their library into their graveyard, and then you draw a card. And for minus eight, you draw seven cards. Then if your library has no cards in it, you win the game. So Jace Wielder of Secrets is reminiscent of Laboratory Maniac, another card that just says you win the game if you would draw a card and your library has no cards in it. Uh, so this is another one of our win conditions. You know, we do have lots of card draw in this deck, lots of card advantage in this deck. What do you know? We're playing a million Planeswalkers. Not a million, but 21 Planeswalkers. So there are plenty of card draw effects in this deck, or at least card advantage effects, and I don't think it'd be hard at all to draw our entire deck, you know, without even doing some kind of stupid combo that, like, exiles our deck or something. I mean, just I'm straight saying up, just by drawing all the cards we draw, because we do have plenty of good card draw in here. So, we'll get there later, but yeah, uh, definitely having the minus eight ability doubled up with Rowan's emblem, you know, you're going to be drawing 14 cards, and that's definitely going to get you to winning the game faster with Jace Wielder of Mysteries. Next we have Chandra, Torch of Defiance. Two and two red for a Planeswalker that enters with four loyalty counters. She has four abilities. Plus one, exile the top card of your library. You may cast that card. If you don't, Chandra, Torch of Defiance, deals two damage to each opponent. The next plus one is you add two red mana to your mana pool. Not bad. Minus three, Chandra Torch of Defiance deals four damage to target creature. And finally, minus seven, you get an emblem with whenever you cast a spell, this emblem deals five damage to target creature or player, which has been eroded to any target. So, Chandra Torch of Defiance is so awesome in this deck. It's giving us card advantage. It's ramping us. It's allowing us to deal four damage to target creature. And just imagine, again, if we could get... Rowan's emblem and then Chandra's emblem where you'd be getting two Chandra emblems where we're going to be dealing 10 damage to any target. That's awesome. Next we have Karn, Scion of Urza. Four mana for a Planeswalker that enters with five loyalty counters. Plus one, reveal the top two cards of your library. An opponent chooses one of them. Put that card into your hand and exile the other with a silver counter on it. For minus one, you put a card you own with a silver counter on it from exile into your hand. And finally, minus two, you create a zero, zero colorless construct artifact creature token with this creature gets plus one, plus one for each artifact you control. So 
Karn is uh, probably our first uh, non-budget card we're coming across here. Uh, this is a Planeswalker deck, so, you know, what, what do you know? It's not very budget-friendly if you want it to work. You know, you want to have some good Planeswalkers in there. And so I bought a billion Dominaria packs myself. I've got a several Karns lying around. Uh, he's just a great card in any deck, man. Just great card advantage. That minus two almost always gives you this, like, little army <laughs> of uh, huge artifact creatures. It's uh, pretty excellent always. So, yeah, especially in this Planeswalker deck, you know, doubling all these abilities would be pretty excellent as well. Continuing, we have Ral Zarek. Two, a blue and a red for a Planeswalker that enters with four loyalty counters. For plus one, you tap target permanent, then untap another target permanent. Minus two, Ral Zarek deals three damage to target creature or player. Minus seven, you flip five coins and take an extra turn after this one for each coin flip that comes up heads. So Ral Zarek is another just in general awesome planeswalker, and uh, if we can double that minus seven ability, we're going to be flipping ten coins, and that is potentially up to ten extra turns, which means you know you potentially just win the game right there because no one's going to sit around waiting for you to take ten extra turns. <laughs> Next we have Jace, Architect of Thought, two and two blue for a planeswalker that enters with four loyalty counters. For plus one, until your next turn, whenever a creature an opponent controls attacks, it gets minus one, minus zero until the end of the turn. Minus two, reveal the top three cards of your library. An opponent separates those cards into two piles. Put one pile into your hand and the other on the bottom of your library in any order. Minus eight, for each player, search that player's library for a non-land card, exile it, then that player shuffles his or her library. You may cast those cards without paying their mana costs. So Jace really helps protecting our Planeswalkers with that plus one ability. And obviously that minus eight ability is just amazing. Next we have Koth of the Hammer. Two and two red for a Planeswalker that enters with three loyalty counters. Plus one, untap target mountain. It becomes a four four red elemental creature until the end of the turn. It's still a land. Minus two... Add a red mana to your mana pool for each mountain you control. And minus five, you get an emblem with mountains you control have tap this mountain to deal one damage to target creature or player. So Cough of the Hammer is, again, just helping us deal damage. It's helping us ramp. And it's even helping us protect our Planeswalkers with that 4-4 elemental creature. That's pretty awesome. Moving along, we have Tamio, the Moon Sage. For three and two blue, she enters with four loyalty counters. For plus one, you tap target permanent. It doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. For minus two, you draw a card for each tapped creature target player controls. And for minus eight, you get an emblem with you have no maximum hand size, and whenever a card is put into your graveyard from anywhere, you may return it to your hand. So the plus one ability is great for protecting our planeswalkers. The minus two ability works really great with Rowan Kenrith's plus two ability because Rowan Kenrith's plus two ability could cause your opponents to tap down all of their creatures. So with Rowan's plus two and Tamio's minus two, you could draw a lot of cards. And finally, that, that minus eight ability is just game winning. It's going to guarantee that our planeswalkers will never go away. Next, we have Ugin the Ineffable. Six mana for a Planeswalker that enters with four loyalty counters. His static ability says, Colorless spells we cast cost two less to cast. For plus one, exile the top card of your library face down and look at it. Create a 2-2 colorless spirit creature token. When that token leaves the battlefield, put the exiled card into your hand. For minus three, you destroy target permanent. That's one or more colors. So the static effect is pretty useful. We have some artifacts in the deck. The plus one ability is just great card advantage, but more importantly, it's getting us those two two tokens that we're going to use to protect our Planeswalkers. We want to have a ton of tokens in this deck. Finally, that minus three ability is just solid removal, really useful in any commander deck. Next, we have Tezzeret, Artifice Master. Three and two blue. He enters with five loyalty counters. For plus one, you create a 1-1 colorless Thopter artifact creature token with flying. For zero, 
draw a card. If you control three or more artifacts, draw two cards instead. And for minus nine, you get an emblem with at the beginning of your end step. Search your library for a permanent card and put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. So the plus one effect is giving us awesome tokens to protect our planeswalkers because those tokens have flying. That's great. Zero effect can draw us up to two cards. Wow, who does that? That's amazing. Just draw up to two cards for zero. And minus nine, that emblem is uh, just every single turn we get any permanent we want. Well, that's going to be putting any planeswalker we want onto the battlefield every single turn. That's pretty amazing and game winning as well. Next, we have Jace, Unraveler of Secrets, three and two blue for a planeswalker that enters the five loyalty counters. For plus one, you scry one, then draw a card. Minus two, return target creature to its owner's hand. And minus eight, you get an emblem with whenever an opponent casts his or her first spell each turn, counter that spell. Yeah, so plus one, just some great card advantage. Minus two, some solid creature removal. And minus eight, you're going to be countering your opponent's spells each turn. That's great. Chandra Flamecaller is next for four and two red. Enters with four loyalty counters. Plus one, you put two, three, one red elemental creature tokens with haste onto the battlefield. Exile them at the beginning of the next end step. For zero, you discard all the cards in your hand, then draw that many cards plus one. And for minus X, Chandra Flamecaller deals X damage to each creature. So the plus one ability is giving us our creatures that we want to use for combat damage specifically because lots of our other creatures are going to be hanging back, you know, defending. So those three ones are definitely made to attack right away. And, uh, you know, if we can potentially get four of them with, you know, doubling them with Rowan's minus eight ability. Oh, gosh, that's 12 power right there. That's awesome. The zero ability is card advantage because you're drawing that many plus one. That's great. And finally, the minus X ability is a board wipe, just what we need sometimes for a Planeswalker deck. Next, we have Teferi, Temporal Arc Mage. Four and two blue for a Planeswalker that enters with five loyalty counters. For plus one, you look at the top two cards of your library, put one of them into your hand and the other onto the bottom of your library. Minus one, untap up to four target permanents and minus 10, you get an emblem with, you may activate loyalty abilities of Planeswalkers you control and any player's turn, any time you could cast an instant. So, this pretty much means you get to activate your Planeswalkers loyalty, loyalty abilities on each player's turn. Instant speed. That is just ridiculous, and you're going to be ultimating your Planeswalkers in no time that way. Finally, we have the ultimate planeswalker, the hero of War of the Spark, who trapped Nicol Bolas in another dimension. It's Ugin the Spirit Dragon. For eight mana, you get a colorless planeswalker that enters with seven loyalty counters. Plus two, Ugin the Spirit Dragon deals three damage to target creature or player. Minus X, exile each permanent with converted mana cost X or less. That's one or more colors. And minus 10, you gain 7 life, draw 7 cards, then put up the 7 permanent cards from your hand onto the battlefield. Whoa, just imagine if you could double that, then you're going to be drawing you know, 14 cards, putting up to 14 permanents onto the battlefield. Yeah, excellent. Gotta love Ugin. Uh, the plus 2 ability, solid removal. The minus X ability is solid board wipe. Yeah, gotta love it. Moving on to the creatures, we have Flux Channeler two and a blue for a human wizard that's a 2-2 two -two that says whenever you cast a non-creature spell proliferate so to proliferate you choose any number of permanents and or players then give each another counter of each kind that's already there so what this means is for us in our planeswalker deck we're going to be adding a loyalty counter to each of our planeswalkers varchild betrayer of keldor is next for two and a red, you get a 3-3 three, three Human Knight that says whenever Varchild, Betrayer of Keldor, deals combat damage to a player, that player creates that many 1-1 one, one red survivor creature tokens. Survivors your opponents control can't block, and they can't attack you or a Planeswalker you control. 
and when Varchild leaves the battlefield, you gain control of all survivors. So Varchild is kind of creating this cold war between all of your opponents because their their survivors can't attack you. They have to attack each other, and they can't block. So if they're not attacking with them, they're kind of wasting them. And when Varchild leaves the battlefield, you get all the survivor tokens. And so for three mana, you could potentially get. Uh, probably something, I'm guessing, like, you know, six, maybe nine survivor tokens for three mana, and that's a great deal. And those are going to help us protect our planeswalkers, because they can block for us. Next, we have Krenko Mob Boss. Two and two red for a 3-3 Goblin Warrior. You can tap it to create X-1-1 Goblin Creature Tokens, where X is the number of goblins you control. If you've ever seen anyone play Krenko Mob Boss, and he isn't removed from the game, uh, he pretty much just takes over, and next thing you know, you have a ridiculously big goblin army. So, you know, not a bad choice as a token maker for this deck, you know, just making tons of goblin tokens to help protect our planeswalkers. Next, we have Deep Glow Skate. Yeah, the infamous. Of course, we had to include Deep Glow Skate in our Planeswalker deck. So Deep Glow Skate is four and a blue for a 3-3 three, three fish. When Deep Glow Skate enters the battlefield, double the number of each kind of counter on any number of target permanents. So we're going to double the number of loyalty counters on all of our Planeswalkers. Yeah. So what you want to make sure you do is you don't activate your Planeswalkers until after you cast Deep Glow Skate so that you can pretty much ultimate with your Planeswalkers right away. That's awesome. Next we have Neheb the Eternal. Three and two blue for a legendary zombie minotaur warrior, which is a 4-6, and it has a flicked 3. So whenever this creature becomes blocked, defending player loses 3 life. And Neheb also says, at the beginning of your post-combat main phase, add red mana to your mana pool for each one life your opponents have lost this turn. So, if you have something like uh, Chandra, right? Chandra can be dealing 2 damage to each opponent, then that means on your post-combat main phase, you could be adding six mana to your mana pool with Neheb. And Neheb, all by himself, has a flicked three, so as long as he survives, you're definitely going to be adding three red mana to your mana pool. So just some nice, uh, solid ramp in red, uh, especially with Planeswalkers that can deal each of our opponent's damage. That's great. Next, we have Karanos, God of Storms. Three, a blue and a red for a 6-5 god with indestructible. As long as your devotion to blue and red is less than seven, Karanos isn't a creature. And reveal the first card you draw on each of your turns. Whenever you reveal a land card this way, draw a card. Whenever you reveal a non-land card this way, Karanos deals three damage to any target. So Karanos is either card advantage or removal every single turn and that's great. That's just awesome. And when you get your devotion up to seven, then he's a six five indestructible blocker. If you don't know what devotion means, devotion refers to the mana symbols in the mana costs of permanence you control. So let's say for example you had all five of these cards on the screen on the battlefield. Then your devotion to blue would be nine. Uh, your devotion to blue and red would be nine, and Karanos, God of Storms, would be a creature, but if Karanos was on the battlefield all by himself, your devotion to blue and red would only be two, and he wouldn't be a creature. He'd just be an indestructible enchantment at that point. So Karanos, again, just great for a card advantage or removal every single turn. Next we have the Locust God. Four, a blue and a red for another god. This one has flying, and it's a 4-4, and whenever you draw a card, put a 1-1 one, one blue and red insect creature token with flying in haste on the battlefield. And for two, a blue and a red, you can draw a card, then discard a card. Finally, when the Locust God dies, return it to its owner's hand at the beginning of the next end step. So as long as your opponents don't exile it from your graveyard, you're pretty much always going to be getting the Locust God back. And, uh, yeah, just whenever you draw a card, make a 1-1 one, one blue and red insect creature token with flying in haste. Hey, man, we're playing a Planeswalker deck, right? So we're going to be drawing tons of cards, and we can potentially make tons of flying insect creature tokens. That's awesome. Next, we have Niv-Mizzet Perrin. Three blue and three red for a 5-5 five, five dragon wizard. This spell can't be countered. 
It has flying, of course. Whenever you draw a card, niv mizzet Perrin deals one damage to any target, and whenever a player casts an instant or sorcery spell, you draw a card. So again, we only have about like 12 instant or sorcery spells, spells in this deck, but uh, it, it also works whenever our opponents cast instant or sorcery spells. That's great. Uh, also, just having a 5-5 flyer is really important, and we are going to be drawing tons of cards, so we are actually going to be dealing tons of damage to our opponents with Niv-Mizzet's Niv triggered ability there. Niv-Mizzet the Fire Mind is really similar. It's 2, 2 blue, and 2 red for a 4-4 Dragon Wizard with flying, and whenever you draw a card, Niv-Mizzet the Fire Mind deals 1 damage to any target, and you can just tap Niv-Mizzet the Fire Mind to draw a card. So yeah, Nimbizit, uh, both these versions of them are pretty great at just, you know, dealing, uh, you know, they're, they're just great removal for creatures, they're great at finishing off players, uh, yeah, and they're just great in any deck that draws a lot of cards, which, like I said, we're going to be drawing a lot of cards. Moving along, we have Magma Phoenix. Three and two red for a 3-3 three, three Phoenix with flying. When Magma Phoenix is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, it deals three damage to each creature and each player. And you can pay three and two red to return Magma Phoenix from your graveyard to your hand. So Magma Phoenix is kind of like a little anger of the gods on a creature, right? Just whenever we need to... Uh, or no, well, we don't have many sacrifice outlets in the deck, or probably any. <laughs> Maybe I should put one in here. But if this dies, it's going to take all your opponent's creatures toughness three or less with it you know that's pretty sweet uh so having lots of board wipes is really important in any planeswalker deck obviously next we have combustible gear hulk four and two red for a six six construct with first strike when combustible gear hulk enters the battlefield target opponent may have you put uh may have you draw three cards if that player doesn't Put the top three cards of your library into your graveyard, then Combustible Gear Hulk deals damage to that player equal to the total converted mana cost of those cards. So with Combustible Gear Hulk, you have to be a little political, you know, you have to figure out which player is probably going to let you draw the cards because they're too low on life to take the risk of taking all that damage, all right? So nice little card advantage on a creature here. Water, love it. All right. Next, we have Consecrated Sphinx, 4 and 2 blue for a 4-6 Flying Sphinx, and it says whenever an opponent draws a card, you may draw two cards, yeah, tons of cards, just like I said, we're going to be drawing tons of cards, uh, yeah, the Jace is probably going to have no problem winning us the game, because we're going we're to be drawing so many bloody cards. Next we have Nezahal Primal Tide, 5 and 2 blue for a 7-7 seven, seven Elder Dinosaur that can't be countered. It says you have no maximum hand size, and whenever an opponent casts a non-creature spell, you get to draw a card. Finally, you can discard three cards to exile Nezahal, return it to the battlefield tapped under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. So, Nezahal draws you tons of cards. It's not like something your opponents can prevent. As soon as they cast the non-creature spell, you just draw a card, and you have no maximum hand size, and you and Nezahal protects itself because you get to discard any three of those cards to exile it. So with Nezahal, I am always discarding three lands because Nezahal is drawing you so many cards, you're not going to have problems drawing into lands anyway. So yeah, Nezahal, really great draw card engine in any commander deck. Also a really great choice for a commander. And so that's the end of our creatures. Uh, the first of our non-creatures is... Uh, Enchantment that's going to be making creatures, so that's why I kind of included it with the creatures here. It's Goblin Slide. Two and a red for an enchantment that says whenever you cast a non-creature spell, you may pay one mana. If you do, put a 1-1 one, one red goblin creature token with haste onto the battlefield. Well, this not only synergizes with Krenko, but it also synergizes with literally any Planeswalker. This basically says anytime you cast a Planeswalker, if you just pay one more mana, that Planeswalker enters with the that Planeswalker enters with a Defender, you know? So that's exactly what we want in the Planeswalker deck. Next, we have a couple of Proliferate Permanents here. We have Inexorable Tide, three and two blue for an enchantment that says, whenever you cast a spell, Proliferate. 
yeah. That can get you ultimating with your Planeswalkers really quick. Next is Contagion Engine. Six mana for an, uh, for an artifact. It says when Contagion Engine enters the battlefield, put a minus one, minus one counter on each creature target player controls. And for four, you can tap it and proliferate and then proliferate again. So not only are we going to be putting two more minus one, minus one counters on each creature target player controls, but we're also going to be adding two... Loyalty counters onto each of our Planeswalkers. Awesome. Next we have our two counter spells. Counterflux is two blue and a red for an instant. Counterflux can't be countered by spells or abilities. And it says counter target spell you don't control. So an uncounterable counter spell. Really important. You can also overload it for one, two blue and a red to counter each spell you don't control if your opponents happen to be making some huge stack. Next we have Swerve. One blue and one red for an instant. Change the target of target spell with a single target. So this can effectively counter a target spell, uh, can counter a counter spell by changing the target of the counter spell to swerve itself. And since swerve goes on the stack second, it's going to resolve first. And by the time the counter spell resolves, its target is now no longer a legal target, and so the counter spell is effectively nullified. So Swerve can counter a counter spell. Also, it can change the target of, like, say, uh, you know, take extra turn spell. If it says target player takes two extra turns, you can make yourself the target player. If someone's trying to blow up your planeswalker, you can change their removal spell to blow up one of their planeswalkers. You know, so Swerve is a pretty sweet card. Next we have our one card in the deck that is strictly for card advantage. That is Ristic Study. So, Ristic Study, two and a blue for an enchantment. Whenever an opponent plays a spell, you may draw a card unless that player pays one mana. So, Ristic Study, if you don't know, is just one of the most infamous card draw spells in the whole game. You know, had to include it. It's going to draw you tons of cards, guaranteed. Moving on to our ramp spells. Of course, we have Soul Ring. Next, we have Wayfarer's Bobble. One mana for an artifact that says you can pay two and tap it, sacrifice it, search your library for a basic land card, and put that card onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle your library. So Wayfarer's Bobble pretty much helps any non-green deck ramp for just one mana and then two mana. Uh, that's pretty sweet, getting you that land onto the battlefield. That's just what we want. Next we have Ruby Medallion. Two mana for an artifact that says red spells you cast cost one less to cast. So if you're casting a lot of red spells, you could be netting a ton of mana with cards like Ruby Medallion and same with Sapphire Medallion. Two mana for an artifact that says blue spells you cast cost one less to cast. Next we have Felwar Stone. Two mana for an artifact that says you can tap it to add one mana of any color a land and opponent controls could produce. So even if maybe your opponents aren't playing blue or red, this is only two mana for ramp here. That's pretty sweet. Next we have Is It Signet? Two mana for an artifact that says you can pay one and tap it to add both blue and red to your mana pool. So this is not only ramp, but it's also mana fixing, so that's pretty sweet. Next we have Is It Locket? Three mana for an artifact that taps to add blue or red to your mana pool. You can also pay four hybrid blue-red mana and tap it and sacrifice it to draw two cards. Next we have Arazka Relic, three mana for an artifact with Ascend. So if you control ten or more permanents, you get the city's blessing for the rest of the game. You can tap it to add one colorless mana to your mana pool, or you can tap it and sacrifice it. You gain three life and draw a card. Activate this ability only if you have the city's blessing. So, Arazka Relic, you know, might not seem very good, but I've been in several situations where that three life made a heck of a difference. And also, it has the potential of drawing you a card. So, not a bad mana rock by any means, I don't think. So next we have Thran Dynamo, an artifact for four mana that taps to add three mana to your mana pool. Pretty sweet. Then we have Dreamstone Hedron, an artifact for six mana that also taps to add three mana to your mana pool. Or you can also pay three mana and tap and sacrifice Dreamstone Hedron to draw three cards. Next we have our removal spells, starting with Subterranean Tremors. For X and a red, Subterranean Tremors deals X damage to each creature without flying. 
If X is 4 or more, you also destroy all artifacts. If X is 8 or more, you also put an 8-8 Red Lizard creature token onto the battlefield. This is a great removal spell for Commander. can get rid of all of your opponent's artifacts. It leaves all your Planeswalkers alive. It doesn't deal any damage to you. And it also can give you an 8-8 Lizard creature token. Next, we have Starstorm X and 2 Red. Starstorm deals X damage to each creature. So again, this doesn't deal any damage to Planeswalkers or players, which is helpful in the Planeswalker deck. And if you don't need it, you can cycle it away for 3 mana. So cycling means you can pay 3 mana to discard this card and then draw a card. Or you, you, pay, the you pay the cycling cost and discard the card and draw a card. So uh, some players think that you can cycle a card even when it's not in your hand. Uh, but remember, the cycling card has to be in your hand for you to cycle it. Next we have Devastating Dreams. Two red for a sorcery that says, as an additional cost to play Devastating Dreams, discard X cards at random from your hand, and each player sacrifices X lands. Devastating Dreams deals X damage to each creature. <laughs> so this is one of the win conditions of the deck, actually, right here. What you want to do is play this once you have a board state full of Planeswalkers. Right? Once you have a board state full of Planeswalkers, and you have a big hand, right? You then cast Devastating Dreams. You discard your whole hand. You're going to be dealing tons of damage to each creature, you know, basically board wiping all the creatures and making everyone sacrifice all their lands. So the only person left with permanence, basically, is going to be you with all your Planeswalkers. And those are going to be drawing you tons of cards and making creature tokens. And that should be pretty game winning right there if you're just left with a bunch of Planeswalkers and no one has any lands to deal with them anymore. Next, we have Mizium Mortars, one and a red for a sorcery that deals four damage to target creature you don't control, or you can overload it for three and three red to have it deal four damage to each creature you don't control. Next, we have Cyclonic Rift, one and a blue for an instant. Return target non-land permanent you don't control to its owner's hand. Or for six and a blue, you can overload it so you return each non-land permanent you don't control to its owner's hand. This is one of the most powerful board wipes in the game because it is not, o not only instant speed, but it also hits each non-land permanent you don't control. So it basically sets all of your opponents back to square one. So because it's instant speed, you know, you can also just wait on this spell. Wait till your opponent has spent all their resources into their attack step. You know, maybe they cast a Crater Hoof Behemoth and they make all their damage doubled. <coughs> And then all those resources they just spent into that go for nothing because you say, oh, Cyclonic Rift, none of that happens. And also, I really like to use this card in response to their cleanup step. So they then have to discard down to seven. They don't get to, you know, recast the spells and put the permanents back on the battlefield. I wait until their cleanup step when I can, right? And say, all right, well, in response to you having to discard, you know, down to seven, I, I Cyclonic Rift, and then you discard down to seven. Next, we have Aetherize, three and a blue, for an instant that says return all attacking creatures to their owner's hand. Excellent. Next is Aether Spouts, three and two blue, instant, for each attacking creature, its owner puts it on the top or bottom of his, his or her library. So these two cards also work really well with Rowan Kenrith's first ability. If you have these two cards in your hand, then Rowan Kenrith is forcing all of your opponent's creatures to attack. You know, the downside of Aetherize and Aether Spouts is often that your opponent is only attacking you with a few creatures, right? But Rowan gets around that, so that's pretty awesome. Next we have Illusionist's Gambit. Two and two blue for an instant. Cast Illusionist's Gambit only during the Declare Blocker step on an opponent's turn. Remove all attacking creatures from combat and untap them. After this phase, there is an additional combat phase. Each of those creatures attacks that combat if able, and they can't attack you or Planeswalker you control that combat if able. Man, there are so many words on these cards today, I'm having a really hard time reading them all. But basically, the summary of Illusionist Gambit's bullshit statement is that you get to redirect all of the attackers and make them attack something else. Excellent. Just what we want for the Planeswalker deck, protecting our Planeswalkers. Next we have Mirror Match. Four and two blue for an instant. 
cast mirror match only during the declare blocker step. For each creature attacking you or planeswalker you control, put a token that's a copy of that creature onto the battlefield, blocking that creature, exile the tokens at the end of combat. So that is kind of just like a fog for blue, you know, and it also could potentially kill all of your opponent's creatures as well. So kind of a one-sided board wipe as well. Excellent. Next we have Disrupt Decorum, two and two red for a sorcery. It goads all creatures we don't control. So this might not necessarily remove our opponent's creatures, but until our next turn, those creatures have to attack each combat and they have to attack a player other than us, if able. So goad is pretty much kind of like, or Disrupt Decorum is pretty much a, a mono red fog. That's pretty great. All right, that brings us to the lands, of which we have 38. Starting with Forge of Heroes, a land that taps to add a colorless mono to your mono pool, or you can tap it and choose target commander that entered the battlefield this turn. You put a plus one, plus one counter on it if it's a creature, and a loyalty counter on it if it's a planeswalker. So this will allow Rowan or Will to enter with an extra lo lo loyalty counter. That's awesome. Next, we have Karn's Bastion, a land that taps to add a colorless, or we can pay four and tap it to proliferate. <laughs> yeah, on a land. This new land is amazing. Next, we have Mobilize District, a land that taps to add a colorless, or you can pay four mana. Mobilize District becomes a 3-3 citizen creature with vigilance until the end of the turn. It's still a land. Activate uh, This ability costs one less to activate for each legendary creature and planeswalker you control. So this could potentially cost zero to activate, and this land at any time can become a 3-3 creature with vigilance until the end of the turn. And again, you know, because it has vigilance, it can attack and still stick around to defend your planeswalkers as well. Pretty sweet. Next is Temple of the False God, the first of our lands that taps to add two mana to a mana pool. So Temple of the False God taps to add two colorless mana, and you activate this ability only if you control five or more lands. But let me tell you, we're playing Commander here, which is a long game format. So if you don't have five or more lands, you're probably just losing the game anyway. Uh, every time I've played Temple of the False God, I've never regretted it. It has always ended up uh, ramping me because it's just a land that adds extra mana to my mana pool. Pretty sweet. I put it in pretty much every Commander deck. Try it out. Next we have Is It Boiler Works, it, which enters tapped. And when Is It Boiler Works enters the battlefield, you have to return a land you control to its owner's hand. And Is It Boiler Works taps to add both blue and red to our mana pool. So this is adding two mana to our mana pool on a land. But we have to return a land we control to our owner's hand. So sometimes these sound kind of bad, but when you think about it, you know, let's say you're in mono green and you're casting a spell like Farseek, you know, you just spent two mana to get an extra land on the battlefield. And that's basically what Is It Boiler Works is doing. It's entering tapped, so that's like you're using one land, and you have to return the other land to your hand, so that's like you're using another land. So that's as though <clears throat> you used two lands to get yourself an extra land on the battlefield. Yes, you do have to return the land to your hand, but you still get to play that land again later on, and, you know, we've all been in Commander where eventually you get to a turn where you're missing a land drop. So this is also essentially giving you an extra land drop. You know, uh, you could think of it that way. So I do like these dual lands. Uh, they seem bad, but they've never failed me. Like, they end up ramping me. They actually do pretty good. Give them a shot. Next we have Coral Atoll, a land that enters tapped. When it enters the battlefield, you sacrifice it unless you return an untapped island you control to its owner's hand, and Coral Atoll taps to add both a colorless and a blue mana to our mana pool. Again, there's a what seemingly looks like a big downside, but again, here you're basically using two lands to ramp, and that's just fine. I think that's great. Same with Dormant Volcano. It's basically the same thing. Enters the battlefield tapped. When it enters the battlefield, you have to sacrifice it unless you return an untapped mountain you control to its owner's hand, and it taps to add both a colorless and a red mana to a mana pool. Next we have Haven of the Spirit Dragon, which taps to add a colorless mana to a mana pool. We can tap it for any color if we're casting a dragon spell, but that doesn't matter. What's important for this deck is we can pay two mana and tap it and sacrifice it to return target... Ugin Planeswalker card from our graveyard to our hand. So we can get Ugin back 
from our graveyard to their hand with Spirit of the uh, Haven of the Spirit Dragon. And, uh, you know, even though that's just one card in the deck, Ugin is so powerful. Actually, it's two cards. We do have two Ugins in the deck. Uh, so we could... But... Uh, the the of course we're talking about Ugin the Spirit Dragon. Uh, that card is so powerful; it's worth it putting this land in the deck. I think. <laughs> All right, and then finally we have our colored lands. So Cascade Bluffs taps to add colorless, or you can pay a blue or red and tap it to add either blue 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 red or red red to your mana pool. So this is a mana fixing land. Next we have Swift Lo Swift Water Cliffs, which enters tapped. When it enters the battlefield, hey, you gain one life, and it taps to add blue or red. Super budget card, but uh, <laughs> had to put the budget in here somewhere. Next, we have Temple of Epiphany, which enters tapped. When it enters the battlefield, you get to scry one. So you look at the top card of your library. You may put it on the bottom or top of your library. Sulfur, Sulfur Falls enters tapped unless you control an island or a mountain. Taps to add blue or red. Spire Bluff Canal taps to add blue or red. Enters tapped unless you control two or fewer other lands. Wandering Fumarole is a land that enters tapped. It taps to add red or blue, or you can pay two blue, or sorry, two, a blue and a red. And until the end of the turn, it becomes a 1 4 blue and red elemental creature with you can pay zero to switch its power and toughness till the end of the turn. It's still a land, so that's what we call a man land. It's a land that can turn into a creature. And then we have 11 islands and 12 mountains. That makes 38 lands. And that's it. That is our Kenrith Super Friends deck. So let me know what you think in the comments below. I'd really appreciate it. If you like this video, hey, hit, hit that like button or that subscribe button. That would be awesome. This is Eric from Bane Alley Magic signing off. Until next time, take care, take it easy.